Thank you, Tassi. Next, we'll hear from Yadibel Rodriguez, Director of Teacher Talent at City Ford Collective. Hola, buenas tardes. For far too long, the needs of black and brown children have been ignored, resulting in limited opportunities for our youth. The time is now to demand that our state and DPI fulfill their promise of a fair and equitable education for all. Black and brown children in the state deserve access to high quality instruction, highly effective teachers, and opportunities that will allow them to thrive in school and beyond. The research is clear. Our black and brown children are not failing. Our policies, practices, and funding formulas are failing our children. There is a plethora of research that shows what states, districts, and schools can do to create equitable opportunities for all children. And there are many states that are boldly and unapologetically taking action by enacting policies with funding support to ensure that black and brown children thrive. And it is time for Wisconsin to do the same. But it won't happen unless we, as BIPEC, parents, community members, and leaders come together and make our voices heard by participating in forums like this and voting at every election. Thank you, Yadibel. Next, we'll hear from Chris Her Zhang, founder and executive director of the Hmong American Peace Academy. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join um, a collective mind. And with collective mind, we can uh, make the world a better place for our children. Uh, we all know that um, achievement gap uh, begins at birth for our black and brown uh, children. But the COVID-19 has amplified the inequality. And I'm speaking about broadband um, uh, internet access. I'm talking about access and affordability. The world is as big as we want and as small as, as we want, but the next superintendent, state superintendent, needs to um, somehow make it affordable and accessible for all of our uh, young people, whether it be in the rural area or urban settings such as Milwaukee. Uh, without access to internet and broadband, learning is going to be very challenging and um, achievement is going to be very slow. And so we need to get together and come up with a plan of how to uh, bring broadband to uh, our learners, whether it be accessibility or affordability or both. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Next, we'll hear from Peggy Creer, president of the League of Women Voters, Milwaukee County. Thank you. The League of Women Voters is 101 years old this week, and tonight's event is at the heart of the League's mission to empower voters and defend democracy. So we're thrilled to be a part of candidate forums. This is civics in action. This is citizens engaged at the grassroots level with their government about matters that affect their daily lives. So on behalf of the League of Women Voters, I'd like to extend appreciation to the candidates for running for office and to all of you for caring about the issues and promoting voting and to Rhonda Stovall, a member of the Lego and the League for organizing this. Thanks. Thank you, Peggy. Next, we'll hear from Wendell Harris. NAACP national board member and president of the NAACP Wisconsin Conference of Branches. Wendell? Uh, yes, uh, do you hear me now? Yes, we do. Okay, good evening. Thank you for having me on this call this evening as a part of this, this conference call and forum. On behalf of the NAACP Wisconsin State Conference of Branches and the NAACP, a 111-year-old organization that celebrates tomorrow, we celebrate our, our anniversary, the NAACP. I really appreciate being here to talk to you about why it's important to have a superintendent in the Wisconsin Public Schools system that understands the importance of funding our school districts, all three districts to equal and equitable dollars in order to 
uh, ensure that all of our children have a fair chance to the best possible education that the state of Wisconsin has to offer. With that being the case, I would ask that the next superintendent also encourage all of our school systems to work together to ensure that our children get the best possible opportunity for an education. Having been a education advocate, former school board director in the Milwaukee public school system, and also a member of the uh, original uh, case that preceded uh, choice in Wisconsin becoming illegal. Legal. I was one of the plaintiffs in that case that fought to stop the choice schools from coming into existence. But after almost 40 years of working within the system, I've come to the conclusion that the schools are here to stay. And the best thing that a superintendent for the state of Wisconsin could do is to work to try and make sure that all of these school systems have the best possible education opportunities for all of our children and to work together in that process. And thank you for this opportunity to share these, these uh, ideas about why I would like to see this system change its way of working together, but to work together as a team. Thank you. Thank you, Wendell. Next, we'll hear from J.C. Hallgray, a junior from Shorewood High School and who works with the state group Facts on Tobacco Prevention. Hi, um, I'm JC Greyhaw. I'm a junior at Short High School, and I'm also a member of FACT, our state's youth tobacco prevention program. And um, if elected as our state's next super state superintendent, what steps will you take to ensure that the middle and high school students receive adequate tobacco prevention education to help reduce the numbers of youth who are smoking and using e-cigarettes? Also, how will you work together to support schools in identifying more helpful rather than punitive actions like suspensions for teens caught possessing, using, or purchasing tobacco on school property. Thank you, JC. Next, we'll hear from Gianmarco Katz. Hi, um, thank you for the, this opportunity. Uh, well, it's a well-recorded uh, yet unfortunate truth that Wisconsin has the widest achievement gap between black and white students in the nation. Um, and whether that be due to a lack of access to quality education, lack of public funding, or uh, the countless losses the state has taken against efforts to privatize our schools uh, and our staffers, uh, the achievement gap between black and brown communities relative to white peers uh, has continued to spiral out of control. Um, and unfortunately, any progress that may have been made has been uh, reversed by this pandemic, which has only exacerbated the uh, problem at hand. So my hope is that whoever is to become the next uh, superintendent um, for public instruction in the state of Wisconsin tackles this head on uh, with bold and extreme policies that really defy the expectations the community has uh, put in place for public schools, um, policies that set us on a path towards adequately educating black and brown communities uh, in the pursuit of racial justice, uh, as well as policies that allocate sufficient funding, uh, resources and staff um, towards our public schools. And I, I believe that radical change is required, very radical change is required if the uh, State Department of Instruction intends on guaranteeing um, high standards of education for not only white students, but all students whom it is meant to serve and for whom it was created to serve. Um, so I hope that the next superintendent listens to these communities uh, affected by these inequalities and he heeds their advice on the, is on the issues. Um, and I expect um, that the superintendent, next superintendent of the state of Wisconsin, uh, I expect them to fight relentlessly for the students that they have vowed to serve. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have um, some remarks, uh, recorded remarks from Christine Newman-Ortiz, founder and executive director of Voces La Frontera and Youth Empowered in the Struggle.
who are the two candidates? Oh, my apologies. Let's start that over. Hi, this is Christine Newman of Peace, Executive Director of Voces de la Frontera, inviting the Latino community to inform and participate in the upcoming Tuesday primary election for the state school superintendent. The state school superintendent race will decide who are the two candidates that will run off then on the April 6th general election. This position is very important because it determines both policies and resources. Policies are important to our community because, for example, the previous superintendent supported pro-sanctuary policies in the schools, which protected our children and our parents from the attacks by the former Trump administration. Secondly, resources. Our community needs to ensure that we have a well-funded bilingual uh, you know, education programs, special needs are well-funded, that in general our schools are well-funded so that our children have a well-rounded quality education. And lastly, it, it is important that the Latino community continue to participate in elections consistently because last year we had a historic turnout of 74% statewide. And this means not only can we have an impact on elections that is meaningful, but also that in the process of that, we will garner greater respect that our community deserves. Si se puede, mi gente, si se puede. Thank you to all of the speakers this evening. We're sorry that we didn't have any time to answer questions. Please be reminded that our democracy depends on citizen participation. The typical turnout for primary elections is less than 20% of registered voters. The typical, we trust that you all plan to vote on February 16th and hope that you will help increase voter turnout by encouraging friends and family to vote as well. On behalf of ELEGO, City Ford Collective, Souls to the Polls, the Hispanic Collaborative, the Milwaukee Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, Black Leaders Organizing, the NAACP, Mothers Against Gun Violence, Souls to the Polls, Wisconsin African American Tobacco Prevention Network, and the League of Women Voters of Milwaukee. We thank you all for joining us this evening, and thank you to our candidates for taking the time to run for political office and for participating in this evening's forum. Please stay tuned for the next event, the virtual DPI State Superintendent Candidate Forum. Thank you all. Wendell, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Go ahead. You know what I'm going to say. Oh, uh, let me say it's all right with me, brother. No.
evening, everybody, and welcome to our virtual DPI State Superintendent Candidate Forum. What's at stake for Black and Brown communities? I would first like to thank all of the event sponsors, a Lego uh, Tobacco Intervention and Poverty Network, Hispanic Collaborative, City Forward Collective, Black Educators Caucus, Black Leaders Organizing for Communities, League of Women Voters, Souls to the Polls, and the NAACP. My name is Angela Harris. I am a first grade teacher at Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Elementary School, the African American Immersion School, and I am chairwoman of the Black Educators Caucus. Um, before we kick this off, I would like to start with the land acknowledgement. We first want to show respect and support for the indigenous, indigenous nations on whose land our city now rests by acknowledging what was lost by the Osseti Sakawin, commonly, commonly known as Sioux, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Peoria, Menominee, and Mai Mai, commonly known as the Miami Native Nations. We want to remind ourselves that the genocide, broken treaties, and forced removals preceded our work here today. And in the spirit of anti-racism and healing yet unrealized, we'd be remiss not to mention those people to whom this land rightfully belongs this evening. We encourage all of our listeners to seek more information about these indigenous nations and commit themselves to the necessary work toward healing. Thank you all so much for joining us, and I would like to introduce my co-moderator for today, Alderwoman Shantia Lewis. Good evening, everyone, and thank you all so much for being uh, with us tonight. Happy Black History Month. Uh, my name is Shantia Lewis. I am the alderwoman in the city of Milwaukee. I represent the north, the far northwest side of town, formerly the Northridge area, but now we are are rebranded because we are reinvented as the new ninth. So I am excited to, to be here to moderate with you all tonight and to be able to, to meet and to engage with you. I know this is a very important uh, moment in our state. And so I want to thank all of the candidates for being with us tonight. Thank you to our hosts and our sponsors and Wisconsin Eye for streaming this live so that we can get this across the state. So I am just excited, excited, excited. And without further ado, Angela, I will turn it over back to you. All right, so I just wanted to give the audience some rules for today. Uh, please make sure that uh, your microphones are on mute um, so that we don't have any type of background noise or interference when the candidates are trying to speak. If you would like to submit questions, please utilize the Q&A box that you will find at the bottom of your screen. We will try to get to those questions if we have time. Um, moderators will answer Q&A questions at the end if time allows. Um, it, uh, we talked about the co-sponsors. Um, this is just a reminder, you all, that this is a non-partisan and non-candidate endorsing event. We just want to give the candidates an opportunity to allow their voice, voices and positions to be heard. Um, just a reminder that the primary is coming up on February 16th, um, and the spring election will be held on April 6th. Alderwoman Lewis. Thank you, Angela. So for the candidates, we are going to dive right on in. But just before, I want to give you a little bit uh, of housekeeping rules uh, and just to uh, make sure that the audience is aware of what our format will be tonight. So each candidate will be allowed 60 seconds of an opening statement. So make it count. And then we will go 90 seconds to respond to each question that Angela and I will uh, be throwing at you tonight. Each candidate will be asked to respond to the same question. So don't worry, you all will have the chance to answer these very, very important questions that were compiled by all of the, uh, the sponsors as well as uh, folks from our very own state. So candidates, uh, we will do a candidate rotation, which will vary per uh, question cycle. So we're, we're going to go in the order and then we'll switch it up so that it could be fair to everyone. Uh, additionally, candidates, candidates will be informed when you have 30 seconds remaining. So again, make it count. And after that, your mics will be muted. So just now, get it in as you can get it in, but you will be muted because we are on a time schedule and we wanna make sure that we can get to the audience as best as possible. So 
Everybody good? We've got our ground rules and we're ready to go. We're fired up and ready to go tonight, right? All right, we're talking about our children. This is probably the most important race uh, that we have going on because it is about the legacy of our children. So with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Uh, Angela Harris for the first question. All right, you all. So each candidate is going to be allowed a 60 second opening statement. Um, oh, so, sorry. Yeah. Yep, that's you, Alder Woman Lewis, but yeah. I, got, I got it. <laughs> 60 second opening statement, and we will begin with Miss Jill Underlay. All right, thank you so much. So I'm Jill Underley, and I'm the superintendent of the Pecatonica Area School District, and I'm running for state superintendent because I want to disrupt the inequities that plague our public school systems. My platform is all about equity, giving every child what they need every day, and this was crafted from my own experiences as a parent, a teacher, an elementary and high school principal, a UW advisor, an administrator at DPI in both educator licensing and Title I, and also a federal programs in Milwaukee and Green Bay while I was at DPI. I'm all about public schools 100% all the way, and I support public schools and will advocate for increased funding for mental health, early childhood education, and teacher recruitment. Plus, I'm the only candidate currently leading a school district during this pandemic. I've seen firsthand the inequities that exist in our neediest schools, and the pandemic has amplified the need for universal early childhood programming, affordable high-speed internet, and the need for collaboration. We need to change the systems in place, and that's why I'm running, and I'm grateful to be with you all here today. Thank you so much, candidate Underly. Um, up next, we will have Sheila Briggs. Thank you so much. I am so thrilled to be here tonight. My name is Sheila Briggs, and I started my 30-year career as a kindergarten teacher. Then I became a principal and later worked in the Madison District Office as an administrator supporting 32 elementary school principals. I really couldn't have imagined leaving um, my district until I got a phone call from Tony Evers in 2011 asking me to join him at DPI as assistant state superintendent, which I, I gladly did. At the state agency, my focus is academic excellence. The five teams under my direction lead work that includes student academic standards, career and technical education, academic and career planning, career pathways, bilingual education, teachers of the year, early childhood, educator preparation, and educator effectiveness for the state of Wisconsin. I'm excited to be here tonight to talk to you about my vision for education in Wisconsin. Um, it is rooted in equity, and I not only have a plan for this, I have demonstrated success in delivering on the promise of making sure school works for all kids. So looking forward to being with you here tonight, thanks. Thank you so much, Ms. Briggs. Up next will be Troy Gunderson. Well, thank you everybody for having us. Uh, my name is Troy Gunderson. I'm a recently retired school superintendent from the School District of West Salem. We're located just out, outside of La Crosse in the western half of the state. I spent 35 years in public education, uh, seven years as a teacher, 16 years as a high school principal, and 12 as a superintendent. I grew up in a little town called Colfax. It's a, a little town of a thousand people up near Eau Claire and Menominee, and I attended college at the University of Minnesota. I put together a plan. Uh, my proposal for the state of Wisconsin is I think we need to be ready to lead because as I traveled the state, visited over 70 school districts, the policies of the last 20 years have divided us, and it's time for all of us to be in this together. All of the children belong to all of us. The other portions of my platform are students ready to learn, which is all of the services and things we've talked about from early child to equity to curriculum for kids. Teachers ready to teach, which is finding the next generation of teachers and producing future ready graduates, kids who are career college and life ready. So thank you for having me tonight and look forward to this discussion. Thank you so much, Mr. Gunderson. Up next, we will have Deborah Kerr. Good evening, everyone. So glad to be here. The program before this was just fabulous. It's great to hear our student voices, so thank you. I'm Dr. Deborah Kerr, and I'm running for Wisconsin State Superintendent because our kids deserve better. Even though this is a nonpartisan race, I think it's very clear uh, and uh, important to clarify our position. So I'm a pragmatic Democrat uh, with the excitement of running for this position because our kids deserve better. I've had the privilege to walk the halls of our public schools for the last 34 years, more than anybody else on this panel. 
I am very proud of the fact that during my tenure in Brown Deer Public Schools, we closed the achievement gap between black and white students and upward of graduation to close to 100% for all kids. As your next state superintendent, I will advocate for all of Wisconsin kids, and I will work to ensure that every student in Wisconsin has equitable access to a high quality public schools in our neighborhood. My vision is to create a world-class education system that is the highest performing in the country with our Wisconsin promise, where every student will be known by name, strength, passion, and need, ready to graduate into a future that they choose. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Kerr. Up next, we will have Steve Kroll. Hi, I'm Steve Krell, and I'm running for State Superintendent of Public Instruction. I want to thank um, Alderman Lewis, Ms. Harris, uh, the sponsors, and everybody who's watching this event. Uh, it's, we appreciate you being here. And so I'm running because for 30 years, our state and federal government has made mistakes in our education system. And some of the things, the results are we have a teacher shortage in the thousands. Wisconsin has one of the largest uh, opportunity and academic achievement gap in the nation. And we've got a student loan debt crisis that's really squeezing out our young ones. Let me be clear about me. I believe in change and I've been very good at change. First in the military as a training manager and now as principal of Garland School in Milwaukee Public Schools. And I'm gonna take that success to Madison where we are going to ensure that every child has the opportunity they deserve and a chance for a better life. I look forward to this panel and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Kroll. And um, last but definitely not least, uh, Dr. Hendricks. Good evening, thank you so much for this opportunity. Throughout this campaign, I have shared my truths about being a granddaughter of a sharecropper, about being cast into poverty after divorcing my husband. What I have not shared is how it felt to be poor. Viola Davis states it best when she said, one thing I learned when I was poor is that you are invisible. Nobody sees you. I say today, I see your child, whether living in urban, rural, suburban Wisconsin, because poverty is everywhere. I will fight for your child to ensure that Wisconsin makes good on its promise that every student receives a high quality education, no matter what zip code. Ms. Davis goes on to say, the two most important days are the days you were born and the days that you discover why you were born. When I struggled to make ends meet, I became aware of why I was born. I absolutely knew that I wanted to be an educator because I wanted to be someone. I wanted to dream big and make differences somehow. Today, as I appear before you, I will make the most difference in Wisconsin's educational systems as your next state superintendent. Why? Because education is a passion that drives me. Knowing that drive is not enough, I possess the life experience, knowledge as a result of earning five degrees and five DPI licenses, skills from serving as a paraprofessional to a district administrator, and my disposition as the first black woman to appear on the Wisconsin ballot for, West, for state superintendent, despite systemic barriers and efforts to get me kicked off the ballot. As Wisconsin's next state superintendent, I will create a state education system that empowers every student, regardless of race. I'm sorry, Dr. Hendricks, your time. Um, and just to be fair, we wanna make sure we keep it going, but we heard you, we appreciate all of you. Uh, for being here tonight. All right, let's dive right on into to the questions while we're here. So the first question, um, and since we went uh, with um, uh, at the bottom, I'm gonna start at the, uh, I'll start at the top. So Dr. Hendricks, you'll go first. Uh, what is your perspective on working with non-instrumentality and instrumentality charter schools? specifically when it comes to meeting the social, emotional, academic needs of black and brown students and their families. Thank you for that question. I support every child's, every parent's right to enroll their child in a high performance school, public, charter, or choice. The fact of the matter is we do not have high performance schools in every zip code in Wisconsin. And as a parent myself, I know that we want the best for our children. Therefore, until we fix the funding formula and guarantee that there are high performance schools in every zip code, I cannot say that charters and choice have no business and that we cannot use public funding for that. 
Thank you, Dr. Hendricks. I appreciate that response. Uh, Steve Krull, I'm going to go to you, sir. Uh, same question. Working on uh, what is your perspective on working with non instrumentality and instrumentality charter schools? Thank you, Alderman Lewis. I did my dissertation on school choice, and I did agree with it actually when I got out of the military. And I definitely agree with Ms. Hendricks or Dr. Hendricks William, excuse me about that, um, where she has mentioned before that how can we take a choice away from someone when we have schools that are not successful now? And I truly believe that what we need to do is phase out choice, but we can't do that until we actually make all of our public schools amazing. And that's what we really want to do. Or that's what this campaign wants to do is to make it so that no matter, no matter where you live or where you move to, you're going to have an amazing public school that you won't have to think about a choice. You just know that you're going to move to that neighborhood. There's going to be a wonderful school there for your kiddo and you're going to be happy with it. And that's really what I want. So that's what I, I agree with. And Dr. Hendricks Williams mentioned that before, and I agree with that 100%. Thank you. Thank you for that response. And I will go to uh, Mr. Gunderson next. Well, hello. I, I, um, I've made it, we've talked on a number of these things, and I, I like the idea of having folks have charters when they're connected to the public schools. I'm not, I'm not a supporter of independent charters because I believe that it erodes pu our pu public discourse. I think public schools are our collective common commitment to the common good, and the, the more that we allow people to fray off of that, the less willing we are to help. So situations in some of our rural and urban centers are the fact that we have underfunded and mismanaged our funding as a state for years. And I think that the, the proliferation of the charter schools in, in these areas are, is a symptom of that, not a cure. And we have to pool our resources. We have to pool our will to make sure that our public schools are the kind of places that all children want to go, that all families want to go to. So I'm, I'm for public school uh, experimentation. I do not believe in independent charters. I don't think that's the answer. I think it erodes our common collective good commitment to the common good. And I believe we should fund our public schools so you don't need to make that choice. Thank you so much for that, sir. Sheila Briggs, you are up next. Thank you so much. Um, the original purpose of charter schools was to create an environment where we could experiment with innovation that really wasn't possible under our current laws. In exchange for higher accountability, um, we were going to have innovation that we were going to bring back to traditional public schools. I think where we've really fallen down in the charter school experiment is taking those lessons learned and bringing back so that all kids can benefit. If we have a law that's getting in the way of innovation and we learn that from charter schools, we need to get rid of that law for all of our schools. The bottom line is I support parents making choices for their kids, you know, that are available right now in the current system. But I also agree that when we are um, having entities that are not um, run by our locally elected school boards, it causes a problem in, in governance. There's also some funding issues that we need to, I think, rethink. Um, it's a, you know, some of these are drawing against our, our public funds as a first draw and it's causing um, additional inequities in our system. But the bottom line is we need to make sure one, that we're supporting all kids no matter where they go to school, but we're also making sure that our public school system is fully funded and every child has access to a high quality public education so that we don't have to worry about um, parents trying to escape um, to find better um, options for their kids. Thank you for that response. Uh, Deborah Carr, you're up next. The state superintendent of public instruction oversees all children in Wisconsin. All means all. So it means public schools and charter schools, private school choice. And so again, if we are gonna become champions of equity with excellence to raise the uh, expectations for all kids, we need to approach it this way. And secondly, it's secondly, it's the law. And I will follow the law serving all of the children under my purview. But I wanna just also mention that this is not our fight right now. 
Our fight needs to be able to recover from this pandemic that's caused not only a global pandemic, a racial pandemic, and an economic pandemic. There's no room for politics and education. So we need to work together, bring all the stakeholders to the table to make sure everyone has a voice. And then we can decide how we're gonna work together to serve all kids, all means all. Thank you for that. And last but certainly not least, Jill Underly. All right, thank you. Um, well, I understand that the non-instrumentality charters are public schools, but the way that they operate outside of the public school system and not under the oversight of our school board sets them apart. And I fundamentally believe that the independent charter school programs harm communities of color by taking resources out of those communities and local public schools. And it's not just our financial resources. I mean, we need inclusive practices and our public schools are again, supposed to be the great equalizers. They're supposed to serve all kids in the community. And when some kids are removed from their local public schools and placed in non-instrumentality charter schools, it makes our public school system less able to provide for all students. So I would of course implement the law as written because I believe in supporting all kids no matter where they go to school. But I would advocate that the independent charters move to be part of the public schools, board of education or become private schools. The way that they're funded, that's not equi equitable to taxpayers. And I think that undermines our public school system, um, which makes that also inequitable. So it's not just in urban districts, but in all school districts throughout the state. Thank you so much for that. Angela? All righty, you all. So uh, according to Third Friday Counts for the 2019-2020 school year, uh, English language learner students represented roughly 51,000 um, of the students in, in Wisconsin, and that number is growing each day. What do you plan to do to help newcomers to our district to receive quality education as they learn the English language? Are interpreting services for students in interpreting students for students, sorry, in interpreting services for students implemented and in what ways? And I will start with, I will go backwards. I will start with Jill Underlay, Underling, I'm sorry. That's quite all right. Thank you so much. Um, so when we need to serve English language learners in our school districts, we need to look at meeting them where they are um, by providing teacher licensing, um, you know, we have to make sure that we have appropriately licensed teachers um, in our school districts to serve these kids and as well as their families too. Because I think in addition to kids feeling safe in our communities and feeling welcome, um, we need to increase our parental involvement in particular for um, English learners as well. Um, so licensing is a big piece of it. Um, incorporating all students into all our programs such as after school programs, wrap, wrap around care, um, looking at equity in our curriculum, making sure that English learners are represented um, through their culture um, in our curriculum, but then also looking at equity in our programming after school as well. So looking at, um, are they participating in, um, you know, the school climate and culture um, fully? So in activities and athletics, um, and then also tracking to make sure that they're on track to graduate and that they can also access all the opportunities that a public school diploma affords them. Thank you, Ms. Underly. Up next, uh, Sheila Briggs, please. Great, thank you so much. So I think one of the most important things is that we are valuing um, the home language of these students. So not only the language that they speak and bring um, with them, but also their culture, um, you know, that is part of who they are. So we need to value that. Secondly, we need to make sure that we're supporting these students in keeping up with their academic learning um, as they're learning um, a new language. I'm a huge fan and the research very much supports two way immersion programs. I think this benefits and our students that are learning English as well as our, um, our first language English speakers in learning together in um, 
you know, a, a, a mix, an environment where we are integrated together, learning from one another, and everybody comes out um, bilingual, which I think is is a huge benefit. Um, in order to do this, we're going to have to um, make some changes to the funding in our state. We are woefully under um, funding our supports for our English learners. And right now, some English learners across the state get zero um, funding because if there's not enough um, kids to make a bilingual program, um, there's zero reimbursement. And so we've already proposed in the current budget some changes to that so that all students that have language um, support needs are getting funding from the state. And so that's an important place for us to start as well as grant programs to be able to support our, our districts in doing innovative programs. Thank you so much for that, Ms. Briggs. Up next is Steve Curl. Thank you, Ms. Harris. So the school that I run, we have approximately 200 English learners from over 20 languages and even more countries. And we do an amazing job of educating our young ones. And although we're doing amazing, we really do not have the resources that I believe we need from the state to ensure that our kids get what they need. I mean, we've got one teacher per 100 kids right now. Now, next year, I will say that we are getting another halftime teacher, which I do completely appreciate it. So that will definitely bring that down. But, you know, we need to also look at not just moving our kids in a, a single classroom or a pullout model, but we need to make sure that, that all of our teachers are immersed inside of skills that are necessary to support our English learners. Because really, you know, a half hour pullout is not enough. You need to make sure that you provide the types of skills that not only will benefit English learners, but maybe students with special needs, or maybe students that are behind a little bit. Now, I don't want to forget our bilingual students. I know that right now we have a real struggle with materials, uh, getting our bilingual materials, and getting licensing done right now. And that is a huge issue where we've got individuals who are here and they are qualified to do it, but there's barriers put in place through licensing that prevent them from being able to work in a public school and then they have to end up going to a private or voucher school because they, they don't accept their license. So these are two major and separate issues. Sorry, Mr. Kroll, your time was up, but thank you so much. We got the gist of what you were trying to say. Up next, Dr. Hendricks Williams, please. Thank you so much for that question. The state of Wisconsin currently receives Title III funding to help with the education of our English language learners. By no means, that is not enough. One of the first thing I'm going to do is work with our federal legislature to make sure that we advocate for more of that funding. In addition to that, we need to make sure that we have interpreters and also look at interpreters as a pool of potentially encouraging more of them to become teachers so that our students who are English language learners also have examples to look towards as it relates to potentially considering going into the field of teaching themselves. And finally, I am the only candidate whose website is available in Spanish so that our English language learners have access to my platform, to my Bill of Rights, and to learn more about me. Thank you, Dr. Hendricks Williams. Up next is Mr. Troy Gunderson. I think this is one of the most critical issues in our state because we've we've historically been very um, rigid in terms of emigration and, and out, um, out uh, migration out of the state. Our population is pretty um, stable. They call us stayers here. If you grow up here, you stay here. And the future of our state is gonna be dependent upon how well we assimilate and welcome new folks. When I visited the school district of Milwaukee and talked about that with their, with their leadership team, we talked about schools like where Steve works. Just think of the dozens of languages that these folks are serving. We have to commit more resources to this. And I think the answer to that is in, our, in the per pupil funding that we developed in the last decade in Madison. Um, it was a horrible way to disperse um, um, dollars from Madison and it goes per child. And so the kid, people in white Bay get the same per student as the ones in Milwaukee. And I think we should reel that money back and do a weighted pupil, uh, a weighted pupil distribution so that folks are getting that money. If a child qualifies for ELL, the district gets a certain amount of money for that so that we're funding. So Steve doesn't have a teacher and a half, he has three or four so that he can pay for that because that money doesn't need to be in districts where they don't have that issue. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Gunderson, for that. And last, uh, Deborah Kerr. Thank you. Not only do we have to accept the children where they are, we have to joy joyfully serve them and celebrate their culture and their heritage. So I think it's very important that we open our arms and welcome all the students and the parents um, of our ELL. And what we did in Brown Deer is we made sure those parents had a parent mentor or a parent ambassador. So I just remember some of our paraprofessionals, um, they were connected with our parents. Um, I had a Hmong paraprofessional who I tapped on the shoulder to become a teacher because like Dr. Hendricks said, our, our kids need to see people who look like them in, in, our, in our schools. Um, funding is pitiful right now for ELLs. We need to have some kind of weighted factor that will give them the uh, resources um, and extra uh, instruction that they might need uh, to be successful in our schools. The other part is our parents. They need to be true partners. Our ELL parents are wonderful resources. And so we need to continue to work with them to build them into our school community and make them feel like they belong also. And equity means giving everybody what they need. And so that's what we would do for ELLs. And that's what I would do as the state superintendent. Thank you so much, Mrs. Carr. Uh, Alder Roman Lewis. Thank you, Angela. So I wanna to touch on a point, we were talking about the teacher shortage. And so I wanna ask, uh, in what ways will you work to support and grow your own strategies to help elevate teaching as a profession, including funding for increasing teacher salaries to make it more attractive for folks to wanna to come on board and, and do this uh, labor of love? And I will start with uh, Steve Krul. Thank you, Alderman Lewis. You know, it's, it's very tough to go into the field of education right now. You can earn 20% more taking another job with the same experience in education, with less workload, and you're not getting bashed by the media. So I hear all the time, why would anybody join teaching? And teachers that we have are asking their children not to join. This is a serious problem that we already have a teacher shortage in the thousands and it's getting worse because of the pandemic. We need to shift. We need to redevelop our teaching force and reprofessionalize it so people want to go into teaching. Now that's gonna take number one, obviously salaries, but we need to also look at the, at the conditions in which students are in. You know, if we have a classroom of 45 kids that puts so much stress on a teacher versus if we have a classroom of 15. You know, we need to make sure that we support our teachers and that we rebuild the field uh, so then we can have the very best and brightest in our classrooms. Now, as far as reprofessionalizing, I believe we need to first get them in the door and then we need to make sure that we never have this issue where people believe that just because they were sitting in a classroom that they can teach. You know what, I've flown on an airplane before, that doesn't qualify me to be a pilot. And so this is the same exact thing. And so we need to make sure that we value our- I'm sorry, your time is up, uh, but thank you for that answer. Uh, Troy Gunderson, I'll go to you next. Well, this is the topic that falls under my teachers ready to teach piece. We're talking about where are we gonna get the next generation of these folks from? And I think we need to take some serious action to make it, um, less expensive, number one, to become a teacher. We could do tuition breaks. We could connect them to our high school kids. I think we could do some of the training in our CESAs along with our universities and connect that to the school districts because culturally sensitive teaching, the people who do the best with the teaching, they're teaching in the area where they're from. And so if you can, can figure out a way to have, whether it's rural Colfax where I grew up or inner city Milwaukee, if people can grow up in those spots and, and want to be teachers and stay where they are, and we can figure out a way to make it affordable, doable, and happen connected to the school district, I think that's the next way moving forward. I agree with Steve. The danger we face is that the deprofessionalizing of our work is, is a very big danger. We could end up in a gig economy where school districts are hiring people an hour at a time. And just because they, as Steve said, sat in a classroom means they qualify. We have to join together, regardless of your opinion on all other issues. Deprofessionalizing this work is gonna be tragic because the teachers that we have are highly skilled people who know how to serve our children. And once we erode that, the whole thing falls apart, so. 
Thank you so much for that response. I will say as the non-teacher uh, turned teacher during this pandemic um, with my children at home, I absolutely would agree with that. Um, Sheila Briggs, you are up. Thank you so much. I agree with the things that have been said. We have to be able to raise teacher pay. We have to stop um, demonizing our teachers. Um, we have to do recruiting. But I also believe deeply that if we do not solve the problem with the working conditions in the classroom right now, all of this um, will be for naught. Right now, teachers are feeling a sense of inefficacy. They're feeling like they're being required to do things that they don't believe are good for kids. And I think that this is part of um, the last couple of decades of national efforts um, to um, implement school reform that really isn't working. So we've been, you know, chasing test scores in a way that is causing us to squeeze out other really important areas of education that we know are critically important for developing really well-rounded students and in the end our test scores are ending up going down because of it and so we need to make sure that we are listening to our teachers that we are supporting them with the resources they need to be able to do their job well we need to make sure that we are ensuring that they can be successful with our students um, by you know supporting the kinds of things they are saying are needed and give them the control back so that it, the profession, again, is one where teachers can feel joyful and inspire the next generation. Thank you so much for that response. Dr. Hendricks, I will go to you next. Thank you so much. So, of course, we all deserve, we all know that teachers need to be paid more, but I'm going to pivot a little bit more because I'm more concerned about making sure that we have teachers that are reflective of the culture and the race of our students. In 2018, there was a large body of research that validated what we already knew, that students of color experience higher outcomes when they have just one teacher of color. And so with that research, I developed a statewide plan to diversify the teacher pipeline. Some of the strategies it included pre-teaching clubs, partnering with universities, including our HBCUs, removing barriers to licensing, and increasing teacher pay. As Within my first 100 days, I am going to find that statewide plan, dust it off, and implement it. Well, quick to the point. I appreciate that, Dr. Uh, Hendricks. Uh, I will go with uh, Jill Underly next. All right, thank you. So teacher turnover has been a concern and immediately after Act 10, uh, the Department of Public Instruction recorded higher rates of teachers leaving the profession and the number of younger teachers leaving the profession has also increased. And I see that all the time as a, as a superintendent um, who has to hire teachers, it seems constantly. Any, I mean, when you look at the effects of spending cuts um, that maybe force teachers out of the profession, um, you have to ask if having less experienced teachers in the classroom impacts our students, especially our most vulnerable students. And when you look at data showing gaps in student achievement between white and black students in Wisconsin, which already ranks among the worst, um, you have to ask if that's due to teacher shortages or laws that make it easier for people to become teachers. So our teachers need, I'm sorry, our kids need teachers who look like them. And my first step would be when I appoint a full-time dedicated equity officer at the cabinet level to oversee needs assessments and equity audits um, to implement policies and practices for teacher recruitment and retention. But we need to attract more teachers of color. We can do so through great programs like Educator Rising, also working with our schools of education. We should look at student loan forgiveness um, or no cost tuition for the last two years of a teacher education program. We also need to address the series of frustrating tasks that teachers have to go through to become licensed in Wisconsin. And these activities or these tasks really negatively impact um, or disproportionately impact teachers of color. And so we need to work together with our legislature and in particular, um, we also need to pay teachers more too um, and, and as well as our student interns. Thank you so much for that. And Deborah Kerr, you're up next. First of all, I want to do a shout out to all the teachers out there. You have been heroic in all your Herculean efforts to get us through this pandemic. And I know um, that you continue to do this with um, persistence, not perfection, because um, we just got to keep going and moving forward. And so thank you for all your work. And I want to thank all those parents out there too, who became their children's teachers and helped to support 
support us. But I think society as a whole now has a new profound uh, um, appreciation for the work that teachers do. And we need to um, uh, build upon that. And I would like to see a whole PR and marketing campaign to elevate our profession and talk about all those great stories about why teaching is the best profession ever because all of us would have never gone into it if we didn't think so. I also think we need to be intentional about hiring just like I did in Brown Deer. We had the highest percentage of minority teachers beyond just the traditional roles in the suburbs. And I'm really proud of that. We still have work to do, but we had over 60% minority uh, teachers in our school, um, but we have 80% students of color. So we're almost there. The other thing too, we, we did a grow your own program, recruited the um, paraprofessionals who had some great potential. And then we actually paid them to do their student teaching so they wouldn't have to lose their full time wage just to um, take a break from student teaching. And so I think it's up to us to recruit the best and the brightest. Thank you so much. I'm sure the, the teachers and the moms uh, and, and dads who turn teacher <laughs> uh, would appreciate. Um, okay, you all. So that is a great segue into my question. Uh, one of the national demands of the Black Lives Matter at School movement is to hire and retain more black teachers. Most recent data shows that 94% of teachers in Wisconsin are white. In what ways will you work to increase the recruitment and retainment of teachers of color in Wisconsin? And I will start with Miss um, Deborah Kerr. Okay, that is an awesome question. I think it's important for us as school leaders to recruit those kids into the profession. I know a lot of high schools are using uh, intro to education classes um, and creating academies to get teachers and minority teachers into the pipeline. We need to do that quicker. Um, in Brown Deer, I allowed my students to work at the elementary school if they were interested in teaching, working elbow to elbow, side by side with a teacher in a different grade level. I think it's important that we promote all of those kids of color who want to teach and um, help them um, navigate that sometimes difficult route uh, to college, um, giving them opportunities in summer school, for example, um, working uh, as an office aide, but then working in a classroom with the teacher to help them uh, teach. And then summer school is also another uh, opportunity. And I just want to do a shout out to my some of my students, Lauren Williams and Alex Millette, and some of our other kids, Julian Johnson, who are black leaders uh, in so many ways and black scholars who are going into teaching. So thank you. Yes, thank you to those young scholars for deciding to take on that task. Um, up next is Ms. Sheila Briggs. Thank you so much. I think um, one of the first things we need to really make sure we're doing is ensure that we're continuing to work to make sure we have anti-racist school cultures where students and staff of color both feel supported, safe, and empowered. Um, I think that's going to go a long way in us being able to, you know, recruit teachers into our schools. And um, as mentioned earlier, it is incredibly important for us to have um, teachers of color, not just for our students of color. Um, and it's critically important there, but I think also our white kids need to be seeing teachers of color and leaders of color in our schools. So we have done um, several um, things. Um, thanks to Dr. Hendricks Williams for her great work um, on our team, creating a plan for diversifying the pipeline. That is a plan that we um, continue to work from. We have um, people mentioned educators rising programs. We've been working to increase those across the state. We've been encouraging folks to make sure that they're they're especially reaching out to our students of color to encourage them to become teachers. There's actually research that says one of the most important things is for an adult adult to actually reach out to our students of color and say, hey, I think you'd make a great teacher. You should be a teacher. And that actually works in, in um, changing their trajectory into going to this important profession. I think also we um, have programs in dis districts that are recruiting from HBCUs that we want to continue. We're talking about making sure that we do that in cohorts so that um, candidates don't come to Wisconsin all alone because we want to 
Oh, thank you, Ms. Briggs. You got it in there at the end, though. I like, I love that idea of bringing cohorts together so people aren't in these silos alone. Um, up next, Dr. Hendricks Williams. Thank you. It is not okay to fall short on diversity. This is something that Melanie Hobson said. She also said there's been a lot of try around diversity. The interesting thing is that educational equity and diversity is the only area where you could talk a lot about doing something, not make progress and still get your job. Yes, we need to diversify the teacher pipeline, but we also need to start at the DPI with diversifying the top rank, including make sure that we have representation of black men because that is very important so that the students our black boys can see that and say i could be that person you know it's very difficult to continue to have conversations around this because as a woman of color i am very discouraged by the fact that we are still chasing this problem after all of these years so by choosing me as your next state superintendent you'll have an opportunity to reverse the, the disturbing national narratives that we have about the achievement gap and lack of diversity in our teachers' ranks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hendricks Williams, for that. Uh, up next, Mr. Troy Gunderson, please. <clears throat> well, I want to thank Shondalyn for her uh, comments that she just made. Let's just face it; she's an expert on this. She knows what she's talking about, and I believe, and I've learned a lot from her in thirty of these. Um, forums that we've had as she's talked passionately about this. We need to do more. And what I think about when I think about our state of Wisconsin is, you know, we're I'm, like her, I'm tired of sorry. I want right. Hope's not a strategy. None of this stuff's going to happen by accident. We can't hope that somebody wanders into the teaching profession. You have to do this on purpose. We have experts who know how to do this. We have to make it, there has to be intentionality behind it and there has to be willpower. Someone has to be able to stand up and say enough. And I, I, I go all the way back to what I said, that culturally speaking, if we can grow people from where they're from and they serve the communities where they grow up, they do the best, we know that. These folks know how to make that happen so we can make it accessible. It has to be affordable and doable for, for all types of children. Most teachers are first generation. They can't afford some fancy education. We need to be able to give it to them on the spot. I'm just gonna say that if I'm elected state superintendent of public construction, we're not gonna sit in Madison and hope we're going to do this. Thank you, Mr. Gunderson, because I am the educator that you are speaking of. I teach in the neighborhood in which I grew up in, and I'm also an alternative pathways educator, so I did not take the traditional route to the classroom. So without, I think, Dr. Hendrick Williams' work, I wouldn't have been in the position that I am now. So it's so very important for us to continue that. Um, Ms. Underly, you are up next. All right, thank you. Um, so. We need to root out the systemic racism in our teaching licensing certification processes and assessments. And to do that, again, I would hire a full-time dedicated equity officer who can hold uh, the department accountable. I would also work with our teachers unions to restore the teaching profession to the respectability that it deserves as one of the most noble professions. Uh, because teachers need support of other educators and they need the advocacy of their union too. Um, I would change educator effectiveness to be a local evaluation practice with agreement from school boards, unions, and teacher preparation programs, and ensure that it isn't tied to student performance or merit pay, and make the profession, again, more attractive to young people, and in particular, first-generation students, because they need family-sustaining jobs. But I think we look at the, the practice of teaching right now in the profession, and it's, it's so uncertain. And I think if you're looking to recruit um, individuals into the profession, they're not going to go for for it. Um, we need to support our teachers on the job with school-based professional development. Um, and we also need to uh, revisit the multitude of gatekeeping tests that we keep um, making teachers take, which disproportionately impact potential teachers of color. Um, look at other things like student loan forgiveness. Um, I mentioned prior, um, particularly um, grow your own programs as well, which are really helpful as far as recruiting students right out of high school. Um, in educators rising classes, for example, keeping them in cohorts like the UW system does with their people and posse programs. But overall, we need to be intentional. Students and staff of color need to feel safe and welcome in their schools um, because we know that Dr. Underly, thank you so much for that. Um, and last, uh, Mr. Curl. Thank you, Ms. Harris. 
You know, I actually run a school right now that's very diverse, and I'm very proud of the fact that we've reduced the white um, staff population by eight percentile points to more match the, the student body. And that was intentional, something that we really wanted to do because we know the value of having a diverse staff. Now, I will also say that we need to reach out to kiddos. We can't just expect high school or college students to move into the field of teaching. Milwaukee Public Schools has a variety of different high schools. I myself went to High School of the Arts. I went to Roosevelt Middle School. Why can't we have a teacher high school? One where we have people who are interested in that. They go into that field a little bit and see if that, that works for them. So that's one way that we could do that. I also believe that the testing that we put in place to, to vet teachers, whether it's the praxis or the reading test, is biased. Now, I don't have direct experience with those, but I do have direct experience with the forward exam. And I will tell you that that is a biased test. I was a reviewer on that twice, and we were able to throw out some questions and review some, but there's others that I feel as though uh, were not appropriate. And they were appropriate if you knew what was going on if you lived in a certain area of the state. So I do think that we, need, we have real systemic change we need to make on our systems, but we can also put in place programs to be successful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Curl. Auditor Woman Lewis. Thank you so much. At the beginning of my welcome, I started by saying happy Black History Month. As we are in this moment in history where we are highlighting systemic racism, and I am grateful to hear that uh, from the the from all of you tonight. I'm uh, one of the questions is as we are looking at uh, that conversation, expanding the the actual curriculum for the black history what is your position on expanding the curriculum so that it can truly truly uh reflect black hi black history and then it what is your plan and then what is your position and your plan if you have one and i will start with troy gunderson I think this issue, we are at a time in our history and in our state in particular where I, I say this when I'm superintendent, here's our shot. And if you think about it, Northwestern Wisconsin gets all their media from the Twin Cities and for 20 months, they saw the stuff that happened up there. Southeastern Wisconsin gets all their media of their own and they had their own incident. So the state of Wisconsin has been flooded with media. We are ready for a reckoning. As a fifth generation white person from Wisconsin who climbed no hurdles along the way, I'm here to tell you our state is ready for this. And so if we do, my plan is ready to lead. We're going to implement that curriculum and we are going to face that fact. Because if we blow this one, we're never going to get this done. Today's our day. I'm just so passionate about this because I, I feel so overwhelmed by the notion that I had all these opportunities. I worked hard and did all this, but I didn't overcome anything. And we see other people who had barrier after barrier after barrier. Enough. Here's our shot. I'm telling you, as I travel the state, people who look like me are ready for this. And if we blow this, we'll never get it. So all I'm going to tell you is enough's enough, and I'm going to lead the way on that. Thank you. Thank you so much for that passionate response. I truly appreciate it. Sheila Briggs, you're up next. Thank you so much. I do agree with Troy that this is a really important moment in time for us. We have to capitalize on this moment in many ways. So first of all, teaching our kids an accurate history of oppression and racism and injustice in this country is critically important to creating and sustaining anti-racist and anti-biased school cultures. If we don't, we get what we saw on January 6th. We have got to be working hard on this in our schools to make sure our kids understand our history so that we don't repeat it. Part of teaching that history is also ensuring that we have positive representations of people of color in our books and highlighting the tremendous contributions that they have had to our, to our country. And not just in fighting oppression, 
but also in finance, in healthcare, in entrepreneurship, and in the STEM fields. This is something that we have to get right. And as we talked about earlier, diversifying our, our teacher and our leader workforce is also a part of this so that we can make sure um, that we have students learning from people of color as well. This is important. We have to get this right. Thank you so much for that response. Jill Underly, you're up next. All right, thank you. Um, so yes, February is Black History Month and it's time for racial justice in education. So educators must reflect on their own work um, in relationship to anti-racist pedagogy um, and challenge themselves to center black lives in their classrooms. Um, what I would do, um, the Wisconsin standards for social studies were just revised, and so we need to ensure that we do teach and understand current events, of course, but also, you know, things like critical race theory um, or the New York Times 1619 project and the full American history. And I absolutely support teaching our full American history in our schools, especially in the origins of slavery, uh, the civil rights movement, and in its entire context. And there's so many resources out there that we can make sure that we have positive representations of black, brown, as well as LGBTQ students in our curriculum, in our literature, and they get the full Black Lives Matter um, current events um, as well in their curriculum too. Um, you know, it's just, there's so many resources, like I said, the Southern Poverty Law Center has great resources as do teaching tolerance. And as a former social studies teacher myself, those were resources that I used in my classroom. Thank you so much for that response. Kerr. Thank you. You know, Black History Month is more than just oppression. Um, I think we need to teach about black history, not teach through it. I think all of our kids need to better understand um, the greatness in the black history. So I don't think we can ignore the systemic um, power and racism and oppression that has occurred in our history. I think we need to acknowledge the black agency. We need to start teaching from the ancient times of Africa about who black people were, not just start with slavery. I think we also have to focus on the black joy um, through liberation and the radical pro uh, projects um, that defied um, oppression, you know, through our history. And I think that we, we have to realize and have the conversation, just like we are tonight, that sometimes black histories are contentious, just like trying to deal with your own inherent biases. Um, you got to speak your truth. And so I believe we need to promote black history and the DPI should be a resource to allow all school districts to teach appropriately. Thank you for that. Uh, I was just about to go to Steve Krul. Is he still? Okay, Dr. Shandlin, I will go to you. Thank you so much for that question. So the preamble to my Bill of Rights state that every student has the right to an inalienable has an inalienable right to a fully funded education and the ability to to form opinion based on truth and fact, not untruth and fallacy. We have to understand that many of our current curricular resources are not truthful. Yet when our students question it, it's seen as being um, uh, un unpleasurable, as being defiant, all of those types of things. We have to have an ear to listen to our students' opinion. And not only that, we have to repeat over and over again, everything that has happened in the history of the United States that may not be pleasurable, not from a point of blame, but from the point of making sure that history doesn't repeat itself. Thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Chandelin. Uh Steve Krull, there you are, and you will have yeah, thank you, Alderman Lewis. I, I got disconnected somehow, so I'm glad I was able to make it back in. You know, we need to have kids who are physically, socially, and emotionally safe. Otherwise, kids aren't going to learn. And if they feel as though that um, there's discrimination or bullying, then it's, it's not going to happen. We need to make sure that every child and every teacher is ready to learn and to teach. So... What I believe is we need culturally responsive and linguistically responsive teaching. I believe we need anti-racism teaching. 
And I agree with Sheila on that she had mentioned that like the literature that we use within the classroom, you know, we do a really good job at the building that I run of using um, books and, and literature that really matches the culture uh, of, of the students. And it's really kind of neat to sit in a classroom and have kids go, wow, you know what? I, I can see my story or a variety of my story be here and spread around and, you know, it provides engagement and such. So I think that it's important to spread that also to other areas of the state. I think that there's a narrative in parts of the state that, that just identify a group as a certain way and we need to break that narrative by making sure that we do tell a variety of stories to our, our children so they don't end up biased and they don't end up racist. Um, and that, that's gonna take a lot of effort. And I believe that we can do that, but it will take a lot of effort to do that. Thank you so much for that response. As I see we're getting a little close to our uh, Q&A time, I wanted to uh, just check and make sure um, that we are ready to pivot uh, to the audience if we have, um, I see we have a number of questions, um, but Angela, if you have one more uh, short question, uh, I will turn it over to you. All right, you all, yes, we are getting close to that time and we wanna make sure that we allow space for the audience to have their questions asked as well. Um, I think that this last question is, uh, the last question was a great segue into what I'm gonna ask you all now. Um, so James Baldwin um, is one of my favorite authors and he once said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. In what ways will you work to support and create an anti-racist public education system in Wisconsin? And I'm going to start with Dr. Hendricks Williams. I am so sorry. So addressing racism starts with the character of our leaders. I've gotten to know Jill and Troy on the campaign trail and they both seem kind and care about education. But I've also learned that they've had instances of extreme racism in their district. I'm of course referring to students coming to school with KKK garb and racist, building, racist built buildings of walls on the float. The racism and bigotry that Jill and Troy allow to flourish in their districts is absolutely deplorable. They cannot distance themselves, rewrite history, and apologize now. But those KKK shirts, those people dressed up in sombreros, chanting build the wall, that is the reflection of the racist and bigot culture you create in your district. Wisconsin is the worst state for racial equity in education. How can you try to fix this after failing to condemn racism in your own backyard? Too many little black boys, girls have to go through racism and this trauma. Too many parents like that have to try to explain it. I face that racism and I, I deal with it head on. As your superintendent, I will fight relentlessly to make sure that we eradicate this hatred and these horrible instances of racism. Thank you for that, Dr. Hendricks Williams. I am going to go next to Sheila Briggs. Thank you um, for this question. This is a systemic problem. This is a problem that's everywhere. Um, one of the things that we have done at the department is um, talked very openly and clearly about this problem in our society as well as in our school system. And so I think the first thing that has to happen is we have to be able to talk about it. We have to be able to talk about where we have bias. We have to talk about where we are falling short with our children and what we need to change in order to get it done. We often hear that in places, in, in rural areas, for example, that this is not something that we need to talk about. This is something that, you know, we don't, we don't have a lot of children of color. We need to talk about that in Madison and Milwaukee. But in fact, we need to be talking about this everywhere we go. We need to talk about this with our white students. We need to help them understand their identity, what it means to be white, and how that affects their interactions wherever they go. We have to absolutely make sure we are not tolerating racism or um, any kinds of, you know, bigotry 
throughout our schools and our districts. And so we need to lead with that strongly and boldly at the state level. And we need to put professional development in place for all of our adults so they feel comfortable in leading and talking through this um, and supporting our students through this. Thank you so much for that, Ms. Briggs. Up next, Jill Underly, please. All right, thank you for that for that question. So um, in order to address anti-racist behaviors in our um, curriculum and create an anti-racist culture in our school district, um, I'm gonna go back to what I have been saying all this time is by providing opportunities for our kids from an early age so that they have these equal opportunities um, for you know the high quality public education, early childhood um, education, access to great teachers, also um, mental health support, but then a fully funded school system. With um, respect to anti-racism though, we need to conduct those community-based equity audits. Um, you know, as far as having an equity officer at the school, um, you know, working with the DPI to look at our curriculum, to look at our practices. We also need to support, uh, mentor, and be an ally uh, to our teachers and our staff and our administrators of color. Um, and then you also have to speak up explicitly against racism and injustice in your community. Um, the um, incident that was, you know, earlier mentioned, that was a community homecoming. It had nothing to do with the school. Um, the school was not involved and I actually spoke out against it and that's documented um, in the news that um, it was something that we condemned as a school district. So that's how you do it. You speak out against it and you educate and when you see injustice, you say something. Thank you for that, Ms. Underly. Um, up next, Deborah Kerr. Think, first of all, we have to speak our truth. Thank you, Dr. Um, Williams, for speaking your truth, because I'm going to speak mine now. Because when our students are marginalized, we have to speak up. And I did just that when students from another school district called my black quarterback, the N-word. I took action, I didn't accept any apologies, and I wanted things to change. So we have to teach our school community that racism is never acceptable. White leaders need to take action. We need to create opportunities to engage all of our students in diverse learning situations that will help them understand the value of different perspectives and better understand different cultures. We need to have board policies, just like we did in Brown Deer. There are non-negotiables in how you interact in our school district that explicitly state what the non-negotiables are for conduct and much needed values of character in all of our schools. We also need to accept that we all have achievement gaps. Even the highest performing school districts in the state and in the country have achievement gaps. And so we have to make sure that parents have a, a spot at the table and that we come together as diverse school communities and collectively engage in discussions about race, marginalizations, and inequities. The DPI has a wonderful uh, program that uh, has an e-course for equity, but that's only the beginning. We have to make this a focus in our state. Thank you so much for that, uh, Ms. Carr. Up next, we will have Steve Curl. Thank you, Ms. Harris. You know, I went to uh, integrated schools, and so I really didn't see uh, true racism um, until I was in the military. And it was, it was actually, I mean, I, I can't even speak to it. But like what we need to do, what we need to do in our schools, and I do believe that integration definitely works. I mean, it worked for me. And I do believe though that in areas where that's not possible, that we do need to address anti-racism or make sure we have anti-racism. And But that includes making sure that we address systemic oppression and the languages of oppression too. You know, because people try to control one another with their language, whether, you know, they'll use certain words to make someone else feel less so then they can feel better about themselves. And I think that we need to make sure we, we uh, get rid of all of that, that we stop it immediately and prevent any of that. So everybody does feel, you know, physically, emotionally, and socially, you know, safe in, in the environment that they're in. 
You know, I, I can't imagine this, but this is almost what I imagine is there's folks who are white who are going, well, I don't want equality because then I have to compete more with more people and I feel better about myself if I don't do whatever. And I don't know if that's what it is, but maybe it is. And so we need to definitely think about power. We need to think about language. We need to think about oppression and how we can actually create an equal and equitable system across our state. And this is a big challenge. But I think that, you know, everybody here is is on the same track on that. And I think that we can work. All right, Mr. Curl, thank you so much for that. Last but not least, Mr. Gunderson. Well, thank you for that. I, I stand by my belief that our state's at a time when we, we have the willpower and the opportunity to move forward. And I respect Dr. Hendricks, and I've stated a number of times, there's, we've had equal careers, but there isn't any reason why she had so many more hurdles than I did. And that's part of the reason I'm in this race, because it's not right. I'll address the fact that we had a student wear a KKK shirt when I was at a school district. We immediately dealt with that. We immediately spoke out. We immediately disciplined that child. It's completely wrong. The, the energy and the angst over this thing has got us all like this. It is time to lead people. And I stand by the fact that I think our state is finally ready to move forward. And I'm gonna do my part, whatever that is, to move the conversation ahead. Because I just deeply believe that until and unless we are all in this together and we are willing to accept the fact that our terrible past has been awful and we are ready to move together as one, we aren't gonna be able to address this. I stand by what I've said. I stand by my commitment and I mean what I meant. Thank you all so much for answering um, that question. You know, it is not enough to be non-racist. We must also be anti-racist. Um, I am going to turn it over to Alderwoman Lewis for one last question. Thank you so much, Angela. I am going to go to the audience and ask this question because I think it is so fitting for where we are. I want to appreciate each person uh, who submitted questions because I'm looking in the chat. At, and there are a number of phenomenal ones. Uh, this one I want to um, to mention was uh, asked by Jasmine Moore. She says, one in, one in four children are affected by trauma. And we can insert that all of our children now, uh, because we are in the state of a global pandemic are affected by trauma, which which may affect brain development. Uh, and we know that it's it's true. It does affect brain development. How will you develop and implement programs to address the barriers trauma creates in learning, especially in this environment? And I will start with, who did I miss before? I will start with You muted right at the end, other woman, Lewis. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Technology. I will start with Deborah Kerr. Very good. Well, I wanted us to think about um, a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. And that's why when we're dealing with racism, trauma, mental health issues, we've got to stand up and provide opportunities for our kids, but also teach one another how to act in this crazy world that we're living in. We finally are waking up to the fact that we have tremendous inequities that have been exacerbated by this COVID-19. But what we did in Brown Deer, we worked with other agencies to help deal with our students, to mentor them and coach them and help them understand that they are good people no matter what's going on in their lives. So we've been working collaboratively with Strive 365 and doing other trainings in our after before and after school programs. You know, it's very important that we address the needs of our kids, social, emotional, and mental health wise, because if we don't, they can't learn. Thank you for that. Shakes, you've got next. Thank you. Um, this is definitely a problem that is front and center for us moving forward. While we had trending um, mental health issues in the state heading in the wrong direction for quite some time prior um, to the pandemic, we all know that this has been um, made much worse, um, particularly in black and brown communities. We know that um, the effects have been felt much worse. 
And so it's important for us to make sure we one, have trained mental health professionals in our schools available to support our students. And so um, additional funding to support that is something that's critically important for us to do at the, at the state level. Um, but we also need to make sure that while we are working with proactively and um, in supporting students that are dealing with whatever traumas um, they've had in their lives, we're also very carefully and knowingly working with high expectations academically with these kids as well. So um, because a student has you know, dealt with trauma in their past, while we don't ignore that and we certainly need to address that, we also do not use it as an excuse to not support our students in succeeding academically. So we have to make sure that we're holding them to high expectations in a compassionate way, going the extra mile to give them extra time, extra attention, extra resources, but still expecting high levels of performance from them because otherwise we're just adding to their trauma. Thank you so much for that. Steve Krull. So as I kind of mentioned already, I do believe that kids need to feel, you know, physically, socially, and emotionally safe to learn. I mean, if you're experiencing trauma, you're not going to care about the math or the, the reading that the teacher is presenting right there. Your, your mind is somewhere else. And so really, one of the things that we have talked about, and I believe that um, by the way, this, this pandemic has made it worse, for sure. One of the things that we immediately talked about as we went to virtual uh, earlier last year is the number one thing, the most important thing, is social-emotional learning and getting kids, getting kids where they need to be in that, that baseline. Because again, they're not going to be able to do anything else unless you have them um, ready to learn. And so... We need to double down on that. We need to stop focusing on, on the testing, reading, and math as much as we do and start focusing on the kid and making sure the kid is prepared to learn. Then they will be prepared for life because school is more about not just reading and writing. It's about living in a society. It's about problem solving. It's about creative thinking. And we need to get those skills to our kiddos, but we can't do it if they're focused on trauma. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Shandlin. You know, I first need to address that misrepresentation by Jill. This is too important and I cannot move on just yet. Jill, do not try to minimize this. Do not try to gaslight black and brown folk who experienced trauma from his horrific displays of racism. This is about the black and brown families watching this and their right to feel safe when they send their children to school. You don't get to tell us how to feel and you can't pretend like racism isn't a problem. That float was in your district and you didn't say anything to children. Now what I'm going to say is our children are traumatized by racism over and over and over in our community. That's why it's so important for us to have mentors. That's why it's so important for us to have supportive services in our schools, like I have in my Bill of Rights. Our children need someone who's a social worker, they need counselors, and they need supportive people to help them get through what they have to deal with on a daily basis. Thank you, Dr. Chandelin. Jill Underly. All right, thank you so much for the question. Um, so I'm a big believer in trauma-informed care. Um, it is something that we have educated all of our current teachers in, and when we get new staff, we educate them in this as well. And so educator training um, for trauma-informed care, trauma care is very important. We also need to listen to our students and provide them um, mental health resources in schools so that they can access them and fully address their mental health. Um, it's also important to look at our after school programming and after school care for kids to address social emotional growth and positive relationships. Um, and as it was mentioned by other candidates, um, this was an issue before the pandemic and the pandemic has exacerbated these issues, especially in high poverty communities, rural areas hit hard by 
the dairy recession, and in our black and brown communities especially, where the pandemic has hit them hard, especially working mothers. Um, one of the great things about an equity agenda, however, is that it takes a trauma-informed approach because doing this also considers, you know, that we need to modify our policies, our procedures, and our, our treatment strategies from the top down to ensure that they're not likely to mirror the common characteristics of trauma experiences. We also need to ensure that we address substance abuse and mental health services in our communities and in our systems to create a trauma-informed environment. Thank you. Thank you so much for that response. And finally. Me? <laughs> oh, sorry, did I cut out again? <laughs> My apologies. <clears throat> we all understand that uh, human beings are tribal people, creatures. We do the best when we work together. We do the best when we are face to face, when we are tackling a task together and the isolation created by the pandemic and the trauma that puts on folks as they're isolated and all the other things that happen to you when you're away from school. Uh, just has just compounded the impact of this. We really need to think about the social emotional impact when we return kids to school. That's going to have to be part of anybody's plan when we return after the pandemic. How are we going to service these folks? As all of the other candidates have alluded to, mental health was an issue before the pandemic, and this only made it worse. And I keep thinking back to touring the mental health clinic in Ashland High School. I think it's a model for the rest of us to think about. They collaborate with the county. They collaborate with the local hospital, the local indigenous tribe and they are able to provide these services within their school to the kids they don't have to waste time driving around it becomes a community where they are sharing the resources there i think we can replicate that on a statewide basis those folks are doing wonderful wonderful work you're all correct it's going to be worse when we come back and again people need to work together whether you're 16 years old or 60 years old we do better when we work together and isolation is going to take a toll that we have to measure out thank you Thank you so much for that response. And I will turn it over to Angela to uh, wrap us up. All right, so it is time for closing remarks. And I would like to just take this opportunity to remind you all that the name of this candidate forum is what is at stake for black and brown children. And so as you get ready to prepare your closing remarks, I just particularly want to encourage those folks that are non BIPOC um, people to really think about why you make the best superintendent for black and brown students. And I am going to start with Steve Curl. Thank you everybody uh, for watching this event and for listening to our, our viewpoints. I do wanna say that every one of the candidates here are on the same team. We are all allies, and I think we need to remember that. So I will just leave that on the table right there, and then I'll move on to what I wanna say. So I think that we need to definitely have culturally responsive and linguistically responsive teaching, anti-racism teaching across our state. That is absolutely true. But one thing that we have not addressed inside of this conversation is the vast inequities within our funding system, where we have some areas of the state that receive almost twice as much money per child in base funding than other areas. We need to address that. That is the equality portion. Then we need to provide equity within that and put additional funds to address equitable situations. So I think that we cannot truly have an equal and equitable society with justice until we address the economic issues. And I'm not just talking about in schools, I'm talking about in society. And I understand that we are a small slice of that right now, but we are going to do our part. Every one of us, whoever it is that gets to Madison is gonna do their part to make sure that we make Wisconsin a better place for all children. And I do wanna say, Thank you so much, Mr. Curl, for that. Up next, Sheila Briggs. Thank you so much, and thanks for hosting this forum. I have dedicated my entire career 
to focusing on eliminating inequities. Um, I've worked in urban education, closing racial achievement gaps as a principal, and getting success in multiple areas at the state in focusing in particular on closing gaps for our, our black and brown children. When we finish this election, we are going to be in the final stages of getting our equity budget through the legislature. That is going to be a number one priority. We have to get adequate funding and equitable funding to make sure we're doing the jobs we need to. Second, we have to make sure that we're getting access to the vaccination for all of our teachers so that we can safely and quickly get our schools open in person because we know that's what our children need. And last but not least, as we navigate this crisis, we also have to be planning for recovery moving forward. And that means making sure we're taking care of our students and the trauma that they've um, endured, but also making sure that we are not falling into the trap of remediation for our kids that are behind. We have to give them access to high quality instruction and support them in being able to access. That's how we're gonna make sure kids um, recover. And I am ready to lead this work on day one. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Briggs. Up next, Troy Gunderson. Well, thank you for uh, that question. I, you. Why am I the best person to serve black and brown children in our state? I alluded to this earlier because I think timing is everything. I think our state is, at, is ready to move forward. And I think of all the candidates here, I'm best positioned to bring the whole state to the table to talk about this. Uh, the, the policies of the last 25 years in our state have divided us in every which way around economics, around race, around locality, all of those things. It's time for us to come together. I think I have the skill set and the ability to seize the day, to seize the moment. I've done that my entire career. When we are faced with something, the glass is half full, here's our shot. And I think as a state, here is our shot. Here's our shot for all of us to do this. And I think out of all the candidates, I'm the person who's best willing to, or able to bring people from Superior to Kenosha, from Platteville to Medford in the same room to make this happen. Because until and unless we all see this as our issue, we're not gonna move forward. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Gunderson. Uh, Jill Underly, please. All right, thank you. So I wanna solve problems of inequity. I want to, and I have a proven record of advocating for and showing up for our kids and our public schools and promoting the research-backed proposals that make our systems better. This job isn't going to be easy and I know it. I'm currently leading a school district during this pandemic. I have worked in urban and rural schools, including MPS. I have deep, deep experience in Title I and I'm very aware of the challenges that urban schools face. And these challenges are similar to other high poverty schools throughout the state, like school district I'm currently serving in. We've got transportation funding issues, special education reimbursement, EL reimbursement, internet access and affordability. Many districts start school years not fully staffed and this is inequitable. We need to make sure our kids have access to the support they need. Poverty is an issue for urban and rural school districts both. Childcare shortages, homelessness, hunger, these are rural issues as well as urban issues and I deal with them every day. I understand how everything must work together from having worked at all levels of public education. And in closing, I want to thank you for hosting this forum tonight, and I'd like to remind everybody to vote on Tuesday, February 16th, because there is so much at stake. Thank you so much, Ms. Underly, for that reminder. Uh, Deborah Carr, up next. Thank you, everyone, for being on this uh, program tonight, and I'm looking forward to working with you in the future. I'm the only candidate who's turned around a school district who's closed the achievement gaps and have the highest graduation rates of black and brown students in the state of Wisconsin. I am calling on all of us that we need to unite and not divide. We need to work together to engage in these courageous conversations rather than being silent and complicit. I wanna call on you to see our diversity as a strength for collective change. And we can call on all of us together to interrupt the systems of oppression and instead advance the cause of human dignity and social justice. We have opportunity to rebuild our educational system to meet the diverse needs of all of our students and our school communities. This is our chance to have a world-class education system that promotes students' voice and agency. Together, we will be the change that will heal, restore, and achieve justice for all. We are a community and a people of action. We can do this working together. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Ms. Kerr. And to close out the closing remarks, Dr. Hendricks Williams, please. Thank you so much, ladies. Today and tonight, we have seen that so much is at stake for black and brown communities. There are candidates who have allowed racism and bigotry to bubble up in their districts. They may say nice things about equity in forums like this, but we cannot trust that they won't bring the same culture to the state superintendent's office. We need a way to move forward. We need someone who understands, someone who has lived through discrimination firsthand. I am the only candidate prepared for this position because I'm the candidate who has personally faced and overcome these challenges. I'll make history as the first black woman elected to this position. Think about that. For over 150 years, not a single black person has been elected to this office. When this position was created, slavery was legal. Join me on February 16th as we make history. Thank you so much for that. Thank you all so much to the candidates. I'm so grateful to have held this space with you all. And I just hope that, you know, after February 16th and after April 6th, we will continue to see you championing anti-racism and equity efforts in your districts throughout the state of Wisconsin. I will turn it over to Alderwoman Lewis. Thank you so much, Angela, for co-hosting this with me. Uh, this was a phenomenal panel, and I want to just pause and say thank you all uh, so much for stepping up because that is not an easy task, first and foremost, but stepping up to uh, answer the call to make sure that our children, the legacy of all of us um, have uh, an equal opportunity to, to grow to their fullest potential. So I wanted to uh, just thank you from a parent uh, to you all and all of the teachers out there who, um, even in the middle of this pandemic, is still uh, on the front lines, you all are frontline workers. And not only do I salute you, I commend you. And I uh, am really excited that uh, we are getting through this together. So I wanna remind everyone that on February 16th, we have our primary. So go vote. If you do not have uh, your, your ballot, I believe you still have just a, a few short days left, uh, but make sure you, you find your polling location because it is imperative that we make it to the prime, uh, to the election so that we can have uh, the right candidate, whomever that is that you choose. After this debate, I hope you have uh, been able to pick a person so that we can make sure that our children, who is our, which is our greatest legacy, has the opportunity to uh, have their minds expanded to their fullest potential. So I am older woman, Shantia Lewis. I am honored to be on this panel. I want to thank all of our hosts um, and sponsors for this moment. And I want to thank Wisconsin Eye for streaming this as well. And everyone who has tuned in and who has posted questions and engaged in this process. This is what democracy looks like. And so I am just honored to be on this uh, panel with each and every one of you. And as Angela said, after February 16th, it is still all hands on deck. So we are going to need you in your perspective areas because Troy, as you said, now is the time. It's the moment. So no matter who crosses, we need to make sure that we galvanize this moment in history and make sure that we can right the wrongs and correct the records. So let's get it, Wisconsin. And with that, I want to um, just say a, a huge thank you and farewell and make sure that you check out the candidates. Uh, if you have any additional questions or comments, make sure to go to their websites and look them up and reach out to them because it is that critical. So everyone have a great night and I really appreciate this time with each and every one of you and uh, Wisconsin, we can get through this together. Nonprofit media network. The recording has stopped. Inform, educate and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin you did is it, the first and only independently funded state civics broadcast network, providing gavel to gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol.